and welcome to Reading Through the New Testament in a Year. We find ourselves today in John chapter 13. And I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had somebody serve you in a way that made you feel uncomfortable? Now, there's different reasons you might feel uncomfortable, but one of the reasons is, is sometimes it's just hard for us to accept a blessing from somebody else. Some, sometimes it's hard for us to allow somebody else to do something that we feel like we should be doing, that we should be responsible for. Well, if you've ever experienced that, then you have an idea of what Peter felt like when Jesus came to him to wash his feet. Now, I want you to notice that while Peter feels like this, this can't happen, Jesus can't wash his feet, Jesus is his Lord, he's Jesus' slave. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus replied in John 13, verse 8, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Jesus says, if you don't let me serve you this way, you are not a part of my body. That's pretty amazing. And what Jesus is communicating here is that we need to allow him to be the one that cleanses us. We can't cleanse ourselves from our sins. We cannot deal with our sins. We need help. And so what does Peter say? He says, well, then my whole body, my whole body, Lord, wash my entire body. And Jesus says, you don't need to have your whole body washed. He says in verse 10, one who is bathed doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. Now, later on in John 15, when Jesus speaks on the vine and the branches, he says that they're clean because of the words he has spoken to them. You see, Peter has received those words as the words of life. They're what sustains his soul. He's been transformed by receiving with meekness the implanted word. And so Jesus says, you're clean, but I need to wash your feet. Now, Jesus does this, and he says at first, you don't understand why I'm doing this, but later, later you will understand. And in verse 14, he begins to explain it to them. If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. Truly, I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Jesus is saying, I've given you an example. I have served you. And what that means is that there's no task too low for you. So important to understand this. Washing the feet was the job of the lowest slave in the room. Jesus took that job. Jesus took that task. And what he just now showed us as his servants is that there is nothing too low for us. There's no act of service. There's no act of mercy. There's no person who's beyond us serving. And what this means is that we need to be seeking an opportunity to be a servant to everyone. Now, I want you to think about this because this is difficult. It's difficult at times to feel like you're the lowest person in the room that you need to be the greatest servant, that you need to be serving everyone. It can be exhausting at times to feel like everyone needs to be served and you're the one who needs to be serving them. But that's the position that we're constantly pursuing. We're constantly pursuing the lowest place in the room. I am not worthy of honor. I'm not worthy of praise. I desire my passion is to serve. And a lot of this has to do with how we view other people. Let me share two passages with you. In Romans 12, 10, Paul tells us, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters, outdo one another in showing honor. Make showing honor to each other a competition. Outdo each other in showing honor. Seek to show more honor than anyone else. Now understand, this is countercultural. This is contrary to the, the heart of man that has not been redeemed. Because the heart of man, what does he want? He wants honor. He wants to be exalted. He wants to be noticed. He wants to be praised. As a new creation in Jesus Christ, you want to honor others. Outdo each other in showing that honor. Paul tells us this in Philippians 2, 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourself. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Are you considering others more important than yourself? Is the first question on your head, in your mind, every single day, what can I do for me today? Or is the first question, 
What can I do for others today? Jesus has set us an example that we should follow. Now, after Jesus says this, he emphasizes he's not talking about all of them. He says this in verse 18. I'm not speaking about all of you. I know those whom I have chosen, but the scripture must be fulfilled. The one who eats my bread has raised his heel against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I want you to notice a few things about this. First thing I want you to understand is that Jesus wants his disciples to know from the get-go, one of you is going to be is going to betray me. I am sovereign over this moment. Jesus knows this is going to happen. He does not want them to be surprised. He doesn't want them to think that Jesus made a mistake when he chose Judas. But the second thing I want you to see is that Jesus knows Judas is going to betray him. And he washed his feet. And he did it in such a loving way that the disciples can't distinguish between themselves who it is that might be the one who's going to betray him. Their uncertainty about who it is demonstrates that Jesus did not treat Judas differently. We don't need to hunt out the Judas in our midst. Instead, we love and we serve faithfully. No task is too low. No person is beyond the mercy that we have the privilege to show as slaves of Jesus Christ. Now, what does Jesus do? After he signals that Judas is the one by dipping the bread, he tells Judas to go out and do what he's going to do quickly. And I want you to understand this. Why is it that Jesus tells him to go? Because Jesus is in control. The timing, the perfect timing. The the Pharisees, the chief priests, they did not want to take Jesus captive during the feast. But that's exactly what's going to happen. Why? Because he is the Lamb of God. He is the perfect Passover Lamb. And it's time for him to go to the cross. That's why Jesus says this. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands, that he'd come from God, and he was going back to God. Do you understand that? Jesus knows he's in control when he tells Judas, go and do what you're going to do. Everything has been given into his hands. It says in verse 3. Now, Jesus says, this is the hour of glory. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What exactly is Jesus talking about? Well, in John 17, he prays extensively about this glory, and he says this. Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven, said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I have glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. What is this hour of glory? This hour of glory is going to be entered into through the cross, through his death and his resurrection and his conquering. Jesus is going to be lifted up to the right hand of the Father, and he is going to be glorified with the glory he had before. This is so important to the deity of Christ. It says in the Old Testament that God does not share his glory with another. And Jesus says, share your glory with me. How can he say that? Because Jesus is God. Because God the Father and Jesus are one. Now Jesus finishes here after doing this um, amazing sign of selfless service for the disciples by giving them a new commandment. As I have loved you, so also you are to love each other. And I want to remind you why this is a new command. The command to love has, goes all the way back to the Pentateuch, to the very beginning, the very first book that they were given commanded them to love. So why is it that Jesus calls this a new command? Well, several reasons. Jesus' command is new because, first of all, they've never seen a love like his before. And what did he say? As I have loved you, so also you are to love each other. Jesus' command is new because as participants in the new covenant, God is now going to put his law on our heart. It's not going to be something external. It's going to be something internal. He's going to will. He's going to work in me to will and to do his good pleasure. And then lastly, Jesus' command is new because it's enabled by a new spirit. It's part of the new covenant. He puts a new heart within us, but he also gives us a new spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to empower us now to obey this command. This command is going to be obeyed from the inside out. We're going to begin with desire, 
and it's going to result in works. We're not going to do works, so we'll have desires. That's not how the new commandment works. And what does this signify to the world? It shows that we are Christians. Our love demonstrates that we are united to Christ. Our union with Christ is demonstrated by the love that we have that's shed abroad through the Spirit whom He has given us. Now what's interesting is here at the end of the passage, when Jesus says they're going to fall away and Peter says he's not going to, Jesus says, you will, you're going to betray me. Now what's amazing about this is Jesus has just given them a command to love. And the the greatest kind of love is laying down your life for your friends. And when Peter says, I'm ready to lay down my life for you, Jesus says, you won't. Jesus gives them a command to love, and then he says, you won't love. Why does he tell that to Peter? Well, because this is about what this is going to happen, and he doesn't want Peter's faith to be shipwrecked. But secondly, Peter doesn't have that spirit indwelling him anymore. He, and right now, he doesn't have the spirit indwelling him in this moment. I want you to notice that when you read about Peter in the Gospels, and we read about Peter in Acts, you can see there's a, there's a power that comes upon him when he receives the Holy Spirit. Because in Acts, he stands before the Sanhedrin courageously, and he vows to obey God rather than man, even if it cost him his life. But in John, he can't even stand up to a servant girl. What changed? The Holy Spirit came in power. That Holy Spirit is upon you. The same Holy Spirit gives you the power you need to do what your Lord is calling you to do. And what's he calling you to do? To love self-sacrificially, to seek the lowest place in the room, to glorify him with your acts of service. Thank you so much for listening today.